actually wanted to thank you all for being part of my talk. And the reason why is that all of you know somebody, a loved one, a friend with mental illness, or have had a personal experience with mental illness. So thank you for being part of my talk on this day in particular. So I'm going to talk about a few different things today. I'm going to touch on the global crisis that we have in mental health and talk about some of the emerging research and advances that are going to help us address it. So firstly, let's understand what's happening on a global scale. Mental health is one of the biggest causes of disability. In particular, it's disabling our younger adults and people in the middle stages of their life. And you can see that by the area in pink in the middle. It's not only the personal cost, there's a huge economic cost. And when we project out to 2030, we see that mental health is going to be the category that's going to result in the greatest economic burden for countries like China and India, and in fact, globally. In the US, the situation is also problematic. We have mental um, health disorders disabling people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and persisting. So at age 35 or 40 or 45, the amount of disability for mental health conditions is greater than all of the non-communicable disease categories combined. Suicide is a top 10 cause of death, and the rates are rising. This is really a crisis. So we have to do something about it. It takes millions and decades to train somebody like me, or a clinician, or a physician, but it takes only minutes for a data report, seconds sometimes to download an app, and we can run a virtual reality, or augmented reality, or mixed reality simulation in seconds with our technology. Let me go on to just describe what the problem is. What's depression? Depression isn't diagnosed on a brain scan or a blood test. It's diagnosed based on a cluster of symptoms. And there's many different combinations of symptoms that can result in a depression diagnosis. A conservative value would be just over 200. So you can get two patients that have a diagnosis of depression, and they have very little overlap in regards to their symptoms. So let me move on. Depression is highly comorbid with many other mental health conditions, such as anxiety and substance use, but also medical conditions. There's so many intersections here with cardiovascular disease, um, COPD, and also autoimmune disorders. Is depression an inflammatory condition? We think about the microbiota, and then we think about the gut and the brain, and that loops back to behavior and back to our microbiome. Is it time to imagine our research scales, the scales that we use in depression? One of my friends, um, Eiko Fried from the University of Netherlands, looked at our seven most common depression research scales. And what he found was 52 different symptoms, but rarely are the symptoms in all of the scales. Only six appeared in all the scales that he looked at. 21 were only in one scale. So what are we measuring? Who's seeing patients with depression? It's primary care doctors. It's not necessarily specialists. And actually, let me go on to say, when I ask you who is seeing patients with depression, the answer is usually no one. Most people with depression aren't seeing anybody, aren't being treated. So what are we going to do about it? When does a disorder become a disorder? And when is it just as a result of a different or unique brain? We're seeing many patients say, hey, don't label me because I am different. Many autistic people, for example. We have to consider these cultural changes. People also investigating the use of um, psychotherapy using psilocybin and ecstasy, MDMA, especially uh, MDMA for PTSD, for example. Our cultural changes are allowing us to venture out into these um, more obscure areas. We have to understand perspectives. Patients are only patients when they're in our clinics, in our hospitals. Usually, they're just people. And going further, we have to think about what all the different people are doing, thinking about. Clinicians are thinking about symptoms and diagnosis. Um, scientists often think about circuitry or genomics. Technologists may think about apps, code, or systems. And startups, we think about the market and product. So we have to converge. There's a huge rise in startups in mental health, absolutely enormous, half of which have come out in the last year alone. 
There's accelerators globally looking at empowering mental health startups, empowering neuroscience startups. There's an immense interest in technology like machine learning and wearables and VR and AR and apps for psychiatry. Is, do we have the tools already in our hands? We have smartphones, I say, I say phones, but really they're the piece of technology that give us so much more. They track so many of our behaviors. And is there a digital signature for mental health, for each of our personal mental health? There are many apps for mental health disorders, if you look on the app stores, but they face problems because the quality is variable. They're potentially harmful. They might not be usable. And people don't always have the best intentions in mind. When are we going to find apps that cause a panic attack? I've seen one in VR. But this closed loop approach is really important because what we see is that with these devices, we can collect such rich data, how much pressure you're type pre pressing on the screen, how fast you're typing, when you're typing, who you're calling, GPS movements. And using that, we can deliver a digital intervention. And this is where behavioral health really shines, because we can collect data and deliver a digital behavioral intervention. But we just have to make research and make sure they're good ones. And people are doing this. Achille Labs, for example, recently published on this adaptive video game that actually performed better than standard cognitive measures in assessing children with ADHD and autism. Is there a motor signature for autism? Just based on this research paper, just based on how a child uses an iPad, they actually looked at this and found that they could actually, with high, sense, with high degree of accuracy, they can tell children who have autism and don't, based on how they're moving and interacting with the screen. And many companies are looking at developing apps alongside medications, like Pfizer, for example. Would you like a nutraceutical with the pill that you're taking? Recent study in the Green Journal, the American Journal of Psychiatry, found that these could actually augment an antidepressant. Look at that, omega-3, available over the counter. A particular component, though, the EPA. So let's look at the science. There's lots of things as psychiatrists I do when I assess my patients. One of the things is called a mental state examination. And we find that increasingly, this subjective thing that I was asked to do, assess the mood and behavior of a patient, we can, we've got technology that allows us to do that. And we've got commercial examples of that technology. People are going away just from simple apps, but thinking about entire systems, voice and, and um, affect and pressure and location and social media. And let me ask you this. Can autonomous cars drive our mental wellness? Because every minute of our commute decreases happiness, increases anxiety, and decreases life satisfaction. Can we create a therapeutic pod, essentially, and make our commute easier, make us more relaxed going into work and decompress when we leave? And we think about that, that'll impact people who use alcohol and drive, use drugs and drive, distracted driving, and help decrease stress. We should also think about, can we design for better mental health? Can our cities be better? Think about the paper routes that we used to use. We used to get a map, you used to plot coordinates, and you choose the shortest route. And then Google came along, and with data and analytics, gave us the fastest route. But what if you had a route designed for your own personal mental health, the least stressful route for you, the one with the lowest sensory load in somebody who has autism. And if people who have alcohol and drug addictions, one that gives you the least triggers to relapse. Listen to your patient. He, she, or they are telling you the diagnosis. And we have increasing amounts of computerized speech and language analysis, helping us to predict who goes on to develop schizophrenia with high accuracy in some of the research literature, but also helping us to analyze text data of what makes a good therapist based on um, thousands of conversations, people who are creative, who spend more time clearly identifying the problem, and learn to change course when things aren't going right. This is a data approach to psychotherapy. Can we ask Siri for help? This is my screen. I am hearing voices, and Siri doesn't get it. This is akin to getting angina, or the early symptoms of a stroke. And what about this? The first one, I, asked Siri, I told Siri I was going to overdose, and Siri didn't understand. It's pretty tragic, in my opinion, especially on this day. And I had to tell Siri directly I was going to kill myself before I got help. 
So we have to bear in mind that all these advances in computational and conversational agents that we have are not necessarily bearing fruit at the moment. In this study, doctors from a general um, academic hospital, medical doctors discharging patients, they analyzed their discharge records, and they found that the more positive narrative language that doctors used in the discharge records were correlated to a decreased risk of suicide. Bear in mind, suicide is a rare event for general medical discharge patients. But using more positive language in the narrative report of a doctor's discharge summary was actually linked to decreased suicide, up to 30% less based on more positive words like consistent and available and developed. Virtual, virtual and augmented reality technologies on the way, used for PTSD, used, in this case, recreating the London Underground for people with delusional ideation and helping by delivering interventions in VR in an increasingly crowded setting. And they can really help us in these clear ways. Symptoms, establishing correlates, you control the environment in VR and developing treatments. First live demo in VR. Who knows that guy? Mark Zuckerberg was demonstrating avatars in next-gen VR. They can help with therapy, PTSD, right. and OCD. Some of the work we do at BrainPower is to develop next generation AR technologies, augmented reality technologies, to help children learn crucial social and life skills right across the spectrum, to teach themselves the skills that they value. And we're actually doing this in adults as well. We have a clinical trial if anybody wants more information or they have a loved one that they feel would benefit. Machine learning is huge. I'm going to rapidly go through this. Helps with predictalytics, diagnostics, disease treatment helps us identify who's most at risk of suicide in this recent paper in JAMA Psychiatry. It can predict who is going to be um, most impaired in terms of psychosis, first onset psychosis. And this is important because the very top measure in this uh, slide is them having an occupation. And what's going to happen? Because 80% of people with severe mental illness don't have a job. And the jobs that we would naturally encourage them to have as a first job where they will learn these core skills are going to become automated. So how are we going to integrate them into our society? In some cases, and limited cases, machine learning can help with antidepressant response. And it's also important to think about social media, because there's some research, again, it's limited in quality, but suggests that even the filters on your Instagram or what you tweet or how you describe things on Facebook are important because they may reflect a deeper emotional mental health issue. So briefly, genomics. This is an excellent paper. I don't have time to cover it right now, but really helping us to understand the complex genetics of neurodevelopmental disorders. In this case, this is autism spectrum disorder. But what's striking when we look at the genomics is that there's a tremendous amount of overlap in the genes that we're finding that are responsible. And we've had a really rapid rise in terms of our findings recently. But in this case, in this paper, a third of the genes were shared by multiple disorders. Our categorical disorders, nature didn't listen to us when we wrote the books that define these disorders, when humans wrote the books. Again, another example. In this case, five different disorders were sharing the same genes, 15 in the middle. And the approaches to pharmacogenetics, so a company called CNS Dose, is actually looking at ways to tailor, um, look at our genetics and tailor medication use so we pick the right medicines. Again, it's an early field, but a recent review by the VA healthcare system suggests it's very promising, and psychiatrists are very keen to use it. So there's still some big barriers. Those barriers include, does a piece of technology or intervention actually work? Where is the evidence for that? And who is that evidence in? Which group of people? People who are well? People who are severely mentally ill? And who's going to pay for it? Because no intervention in mental health is going to be useful, no matter how perfect it is, if the people who need it most won't get it. So I'd like to thank everyone here for being part of my talk. I'd like to thank Daniel for actually making mental health and psychiatry a priority at, at this conference, because I've been to a lot of conferences recently, and you know, some conferences don't make it a priority. They don't get a psychiatrist or mental health professional or psychologist to talk about these deep issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you.